Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I want to talk about the threshold of destiny. The threshold of destiny. Will you lean over and shake the person's hand next to you and tell them we're talking about the threshold of destiny. I've discovered brothers and sisters that when you've been in church any time at all, you've heard a lot of catchphrases and you've listened to a lot of uh, theological verbiage and even theological ideas. And there are some things that we say often with great rapidity and so much so that now it's just become uh, the thing to say or the thing to talk about. And it is the thing that we say to make people believe that we are in tune with what God is doing. And so because of that fact, we hear a lot of talk now in the religious community as it relates to destiny. And everybody is moving and shifting into their destiny. But what I discovered is that while there are a lot of people who talk about destiny, they don't understand how destiny unfolds. Because to every destiny step, to every move of destiny, there is a place called the threshold. Those of you who are married and those of you who were married in days of old, you understand that traditionally, uh, back when my parents were married, a man would carry his new bride over the threshold. And the idea behind a threshold is that a threshold is a place of separation. A threshold separates your past from your future 
your threshold separates uh, dimensions. It separates levels. And so as I come in this room today, I've come to talk to a few people who may be going through some sense of aggravation. Maybe going through some sense of trial and tribulation and you don't quite understand what's going on in your life. The more you try to live right and godly, the more you even do the things that God would have you do according to the scriptures. Sometimes it seems as if though instead of moving forward, you are moving backwards. Instead of going up, you are going down. Instead of being brought in, seems that you're being kicked out. But I've come to arm and dangerous with some good news this morning. I've come to tell you that what you are experiencing is the fact that you are on the threshold of destiny. Lean over and shake your neighbor's hand like you're going to shake it off and tell your neighbor you are on the threshold of destiny. In other words, I've come to make an announcement this morning. I've come to tell Zion that something big is getting ready to happen. Lord have mercy. Oh God, I'm getting happy too quick. I, I said something big is getting ready to happen. Listen, will you tell somebody on your row you preach so much better than I do? Will you lean over and tell them something big is getting ready to happen? If you couldn't get anybody to talk to you, treat yourself like you're David. David said when I couldn't get anybody to talk to me, I encourage myself. Lay hands on yourself and tell yourself something big. My God, it's getting ready to happen. Oh man, you ought to tell somebody around you, you ought to be congratulating me because something big. Hey, my shot. Something big is getting ready to happen. And I don't care what the devil is saying and I don't care how it looks. Don't you change your confession. Something big is getting ready to happen. But now, here, here is the problem uh, that, 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 that the saints have many times. The, the problem with a threshold is that a threshold is a place where either something lives or it dies. On the threshold, either your dream lives or it dies. On the threshold, either you move into fruition or you slip back into the past. So I've come to tell somebody today, the biggest thing that's got to happen and all of these other things that I will mention will be housed neatly within this thing. Um, the biggest thing that happens on the threshold of destiny is that you've got to make a destiny decision. Let me help you understand something. The reality that you live today is because of decisions you made yesterday. The reality that you live today, if you don't like your today, it is because of the decisions you made yesterday. Well, I've got some great news because there are some of you who say, well, I don't like my today. Well, here is the great news. Well, if you don't like your today, make another decision today and your tomorrow will be better. So, so, Pastor, what, what, what is it that I've, I've got to do? Um, first of all, when you look at the text, can, can, I, can I preach three chapters in 12 minutes? Here it is. Um, watch this. When you look at the text, there are some things that's, that must happen in your life. Because the text says that when you're on the threshold of destiny, the first thing that you've got to be mindful of, that on the threshold, there has got to be what I call interrupted traditions. Mm -hmm. Will you tap your neighbor and tell your neighbor on the threshold? There's got to be interrupted traditions. Uh, now, what do you mean by that? Uh, here's what I mean. I mean that if you do what you've always done, 
you'll have what you've always had. So if you want something new, you've got to do something new. Well, give me some Bible for that, Pastor. Show me the exposition gladly. What you will discover is that in Deuteronomy chapter 34, which is the chapter before Joshua, the Bible says that Moses lays his hands on Joshua. He lays his hands on Joshua as to anoint him as the next leader of Israel. Now watch this. He lays his hands on him as to submit and suggest that he is transferring his mantle upon Joshua. Now here's what I understand. A whole lot of us got a bad, uh, uh, we have a misconception as it relates to mantles. Because there are a whole lot of folks who say, I want this person's mantle. But what they don't understand is, they think that mantle means that I have this person's mannerisms, his mission, and his mentality. But I've come to tell you, the mantle does not mean that you have a person's mannerisms, even their mission or their mentality. The text proves that to us because when you look at Moses and look at Joshua, you will discover that their leadership styles were all together different. So, 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 now watch this. In chapter 34, he lays his hands on Joshua. But watch this. In chapter 1, a tradition change. I, 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 I'm going to show it to you. Come on. Look at chapter 1. Verse number 1. It says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun. What did he say? Moses minister saying, Moses, my servant is dead. In other words, what the Lord said to Joshua, traditions are changing. Oh God, now, now certainly you don't want to get quiet right there. Because you know the rule. If you're quiet, that means I need to hang around there a little while. I, I, need, I need to tell somebody that, 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 that in this room that, that Moses is dead. I need to tell somebody even in your personal life that there are some Moseses that have died in your life. And what the Lord's saying is that this is another season. Isn't it, isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't it amazing that when Moses die in our lives, we try to resurrect him? Keep him alive. But if you keep Moses alive, you can never move to the Joshua era. Some of you in this room, perhaps, who are single, and you're trying to figure out, why can't I meet somebody nice? I've got a news flash. It's because Moses is alive. But the Lord came to tell me, the Lord came, sent me to tell you that Moses is dead. And what you've got to learn how to do is move to the next thing. Lord help me Jesus. You got to learn how to press forward. You got to learn how to let some things go. Moses is dead. And if you're not careful, you'll try to treat Joshua like you treated Moses. He, sa he says Moses, M Moses is dead. There has got to be a change in tradition. Even as it relates to the church, there are some wonderful things that we've done in the past, and they were God in the past. Watch, watch this. It was God in the past, but if you're still doing it after God has moved on, it's you. And anything that God does not sanction, God does not bless. Says, he says there's got to be a sh shift. There's got to be interrupted tradition. Matter of fact, here it is, and I'm, I'm on point number two. Anybody in here besides me can look at your life and understand you can even sense right now there are some things about you that God is changing. Your taste is changing. 
what you like is changing. Uh, the people you hang around is changing. You know, the Lord said something to me earlier this year. And, and, and listen, I want to tell you, I want to tell you, I, I, I just, when I heard the Lord said, you know, I kind of just played it off. The Lord said, I'm changing your circle. Now that disturbs some of y'all. That disturbs some of y'all because your circle is your comfort zone. But the Lord told me, he says, I'm changing your circle. And now watch this. And when you change your circle, that simply means that I'm changing your destiny. I'm changing your dimension. Because listen, you cannot keep the same circle and go to a new dimension. When the Lord told me he was changing my circles, I, I said, yes, Lord. You know, just like good church folk. I said, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord said, I'm changing your circle. But watch this. I didn't chase after what God said to me. And so the Lord saw that I wasn't moving fast enough. So on the 4th of July, in, in Independence Day, 4th of July, I'm sitting down having dinner with my wife. And we're sitting in a restaurant because we decided this year on, on Independence Day, we're not going to do the traditional barbecue thing. We're just going to go out and hang out and have a date. And uh, so we're sitting in the restaurant and I'm trying to conduct business on my date. And so I'm on my phone playing with my phone. I discover that my phone has windows. So therefore it operates just like a computer. So I was trying to do something on my phone and, and, and by mistake I went to a screen that I had never been to before and I hit a button that's called the restore button. Which when you hit that button what it does is take your, your computer back to the day that it was brand new. Which means that all of the data that you put in the phone had instantly been erased and so I hit the restore button which means that all 300 and something entries and phone numbers that I had in my phone was instantly erased and I was just about getting ready to get mad and the Lord said I told you I'm getting ready to change your circle and some folk that you erase now you have erased forever watch this watch this watch this so there is interrupted inter interrupted traditions but secondly there has got to be an inner transformation say that with me inner transformation Look at what he says in verse number five and six. You read verse number five with me a minute ago. He says to them in verse number five, he says, uh, he says now in chapter three, verse number five, he says, uh, uh, and Joshua said unto them and unto the people, sanctify yourselves. Sanctify yourselves. Isn't that interesting? Because a whole lot of folk want the pastor to do something God has not told him to do. Isn't it interesting when people come to the pastor, they want the pastor to get folk right. They want the pastor to kick folk off of boards and auxiliaries, kick them out of the choir and out of the praise team because pastor, you know, they ain't right. They ain't right. But the Lord is saying that a sign of maturity and a sign that you're getting ready to go into destiny is that you don't need the pastor to check you. But you have the maturity to check yourself and get yourself ready for the next dimension. I don't need my pastor telling me that I need to pay my tithes. I'm already at that point now. I don't need my pastor to tell me that it ain't right to shack. I'm beyond that point. I don't need my pastor to tell me that I ain't got no business sleeping around with other women. I'm beyond that point. You got to get to a place where you sanctify yourself. Watch this, watch this. He says, he says, there's got to be individual adjustments. But then not only does he say individual adjustments, he talks about uh, people, personnel, he talks about proper personnel placement. Now what do you mean by that? Look at verse number six. Because when you look at verse number six, he says, and Joshua spake unto the priest saying, take up the ark of the covenant and pass over uh, before the people. In other words, he gets the, everybody in the right place. One of the things that I've discovered about the church is that the church is the only place in the world where you can be in the wrong lane and, and, and people don't seem to have a problem with it. And see, if we're ever going to be where we need to be, everybody has got to stay in their lane. Church is the only place in the world where you can be a person who can't sing nothing and be in the choir. Church 
country is the only place in the world where you can have a nasty attitude and be a greeter or usher. Church is the only place in the world where you can be a thief and be on, 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 on the finance committee. Because we don't like putting people where they belong. And listen, placement has nothing to do with longevity. Placement has to do with the gift that God has given us. God has not gifted all of us in the same areas. So we have no business being in the same area. And it don't matter how long you've been a part of the church. I don't care if they just got here yesterday. If they fit, use them. It's got to be proper placement. Proper placement. Everybody has got to be in that lane. Everybody's got to be in that lane. Everybody has got to be in that lane. Everybody. <laughs> I know you're supposed to say everybody. But in Alabama where my mama was born, they said everybody. Gotta be in that lane. Will you tap your neighbor? Tell your neighbor, stay in your lane. I, I, I don't have time to try to figure out whose marriage is bad or good because I'm trying to stay in my lane and keep mine good. I got time to try to figure out what what you know. Sometimes when pastors come and preach, they think that the pastor have told the guest pastor what to say. The Jack came in, he talked to me thirty seconds and walked out and said, "Preach hall." Listen, I ain't got time to try to figure out what's happening at Zion. I gotta stay in my lane with Rama. I don't have but so many brain cells, and I need all of those for Rama. Stay in your lane. I love what God is doing here in Hinesville. I love the vision that God has given Jackson. But I can't get jealous of Jackson. I can't try to emulate what Jackson is doing. Because that's not what God called me to do. I stay in my lane. I have some people. I have some people that told me. He said, man, listen. You're so intelligent and educated. Why do you preach so loud? And why do you do that holler? I just don't understand it. You know Greek. You know Hebrew. Why don't you just stick with that and just talk nice and easy? I said, because that's not my lane. I stay in my lane. Goliath had a sword, a shield, and a spear. David had a rock and a rag. And you got to learn how to work what God has given you and stay in your lane. Watch this. So, there is there is interrupted traditions. There is inner transformation. But watch this. This this one here. This one here. Y'all should have shouted earlier. You may have wished you may have missed your window. Because this next point is the point that's going to keep most church folk from destiny. The next point is the one that's going to keep most church folk from destiny. Because after there is an inner transformation. Watch this, watch this, watch this. There is a progression that takes place. First of all, first of all the Lord interrupts your traditions. Change your traditions. Your taste change. Things start getting on your nerves that didn't get on your nerves before. Then he, he calls for you to make an inner transformation. You're changing on the inside. Now watch this. Then after changing on the inside, then what he, what he does, he says, he says, in order for you to move into destiny, there has got to be an image transition. Now that was first an inner transformation. But now that's getting ready to be an image transition. Look at verse number seven. This is going to bless you. This is going to bless you. He says, and the Lord said unto Joshua, this day, today, everybody say today. Today, today I, and he says, today will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel. 
you know what that verse means? The Lord says, Joshua, I'm getting ready to take them to the promise. But before I can take them to the promise, I got to get them to see you differently. I'm going to try that one more time. He says, I'm getting ready to take them into destiny. But they cannot go into destiny until they see you differently. He, he, watch this. I, 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 I knew. I knew I wasn't going to get much help right here. But I need to tell y'all I ain't scared. Watch, watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Because there are a lot of people that want to see God the way they need to see God. But they think that's all. What happens is you see God the way you need to see him so you can see others the way you need to see them. See, a touch from God, communion with God says that something about your sight is going to change. Okay, let, let me see. Let me see if I can give you, give you a New Testament um, a parallel. Um, 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 you, you remember in John... Um, uh, uh, you, that, that was a man in, 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 in Mark, brother. Mark chapter 8, believe it is. That was a man who, who was blind. The Bible says that apparently at some point he could see, but he lost his sight. You say, how do you know that? Because the Bible says his sight was restored. You can't restore something that was never there. So at some point he could see. Uh, the Bible says that when Jesus uh, found out the man's condition, took him out of town, spit on him. Watch this. Spit on him and then laid his hands on him. I don't have time uh, to do all of the exegesis on that particular passage. But Jesus does two things. He spit on him. He spit on him. Now some of y'all would have missed the miracle right there. Because you're talking about ain't no way in the world. You're going to spit on me. Uh, but what, what, what we don't understand is that that was a reason that Jesus spit on him. Uh, years ago, when you wanted to, to prove uh, uh, the paternity of, 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 of a parent, uh, what you did, they would make you take a blood test. But now, because things are so advanced, uh, you don't have to take a blood test. What they do is get a swab and put it in your mouth and get your saliva and then they read your DNA. Because what they've discovered is that your DNA is in your saliva. In other words, everything that's in you is in your spit. Y'all ain't getting this. So when Jesus spit on the man, everything that was in Jesus got all over him. I need for you to tap somebody and tell somebody, I wish Jesus would spit on me. Watch this. So he spits on him and then he lays his hands on him. And then after he lays his hands on him, he says, what do you see? He says, I see men, but I see them walking as trees. He said, come back here. Come back here. And he lays his hands on him again. And he said, now, what do you see? He says, I see men as men. In other words, Jesus says, sometimes I got to give you a second touch so you can see things right. I need for somebody to understand. I don't care how long you have been saved and how long you have been in the church until you get to the point where you can see your pastor as God would have you see him. You will never get to destiny. Watch this. This is going to bless you. This is going to bless you. Because all the correct folk, all the correct folk going to do the Watusi right here. All the right thinking folk, we finna have a jig right here. Because if that's right and this text is right, what we are doing today is really catapulting us into destiny. Because we are here today to celebrate him. Now watch this. We are here today to celebrate him. Ain't no sense us playing no games. In the celebration, we going to give him some money. Ain't no celebration without gifts. I better not get up on Christmas morning. Tell my wife, baby, Merry Christmas. She said, okay. 
Merry Christmas. You wonderful wife. You beautiful lady. You this, that, and the other. And I say all of that stuff and don't give her a gift. But then about one o'clock, brother musician, I grab a big present and start walking out the house. And she said, where you going? I said, I'm going over to Sally's house. You going where? Now watch this. I love her, got all kinds of accolades for her, but I'm taking the present out the house. There are two things that mess me up. Number one, a whole lot of folks say they love God, but they give the devil more presents. But then secondly, there are a whole lot of people that say they love their pastor who have never done anything or given him anything. You want to know why? They don't give preachers. They want to give you pastor because some people think that he, I don't want him to get too big and I ain't going to make no preacher rich and I ain't going to do this. Let me help you understand something. The Bible says what God wants to do in your eyesight is in the good. The Bible says he wants to magnify him in your eyesight. Yeah, see, see, listen, let me tell you something. Anybody that's got a dictionary already know where I'm going because magnify means to make large. Do you know what that means? That means that God wants to make ML Jackson large in your eyesight. How dare you brag about your doctor's car? How dare you brag about your lawyer's house? How dare you brag about what all of these other people who serve you have when your pastor needs to be enlarged? Said, well, Pastor, we take good care of our pastor. I believe that. I, I believe that. I really do. He talk about it. I mean, he be smiling. You know, Jack got a little gold in the back. When he talk about Zion, you see that gold. But here's what I'm saying. What I'm saying to you is that even though you do a fantastic job at taking care of him, God want to make him larger. As a matter of fact, God's getting ready. To make him larger. With your help or without it. He's going to make him larger. And here's what I understand. The folk that's happy about it. Is going to get large with him. Oh God. Oh Lord help me Jesus. Because the anointing flows down. My, my pastor, my pastor is Bishop James Morton. Uh, Bishop James Morton is not broke. Hallelujah. Bishop James Morton got a wonderful car. Hallelujah. Bishop James Morton live in a nice penthouse over, over Alpharetta looking out, seeing Atlanta. Hallelujah. And I wouldn't have it no other way because here's what I understand. If my pastor was scraping and robbing Peter to pay Paul, if my pastor had holes in the bottom of his shoes and they were run over, if my pastor didn't have everything he need then if the anointing flows down that means that the poverty that's on him is gonna flow down on me and I don't need no poverty flowing down on me I got enough problems I need blessings flowing down on me anybody in this room besides me you want a blessed pastor I dare you to tap your neighbor who look like they may be upset right now and tell your neighbor I want a blessed pastor I want them blessed coming in, blessed going out. I want them blessed in the field, blessed in the city, blessed in the morning, blessed at night. I want them blessed. He says, I'm going to make him large. I'm through. He says, I'm going to magnify him. In the sight of Israel, that they may know yeah, that as I was with Moses, so am I with you. You know what I understand? Here's what I understand that there are a whole lot of people who have pastors, and yet their spiritual hero is somebody on TVN. There, 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 there are a lot of people that have, uh, have passed.
masters and he had uh, they will go and fill up a coliseum yes Lord to see T.D. Jakes I love him to see Benny Hinn I love him to see whoever else you want to name and then uh, I've seen people uh, that will cry at the offering time because they ask for a thousand dollars and they say I sure wish I had a thousand dollars so I could give it and those same people will go to their own church and won't give but a dollar and won't even feel bad well I want to tell you all that I thank God for T.D. Jakes but as far as Zion is concerned your hero ought not be T.D. Jakes it ought to be M.L. Jackson because that's your daddy y'all ain't happy right here you gotta understand this is your spiritual father and what I know about parenthood is that whatever belongs to the father the child is in line to inherit it slap your neighbor and tell your neighbor neighbor I'm mighty glad that I'm in line for a blessed and so I got to get out of here so I came to tell somebody that God is changing how you see your pastor today your pastor is going up tap your neighbor and tell your neighbor today my pastor is going up and somebody said what does that mean for me here's what it means you remember Elijah and Elisha the young understudy told the chief prophet he said I want the double portion and the chief prophet told the understudy he says here's what's going to happen if you see me when I go up then you'll have the double portion y'all ain't happy because you don't understand what that means the double portion means I have what you have but then I have more because I have not only what you have but I have what I have let me see if I can explain it my daddy lived in a nice house but because I'm his child I got the double portion my house is nicer than my daddy's house you say well why is that because everything my daddy had was my head start y'all ain't happy child tell your neighbor neighbor everything my daddy had is my head start I got to get out of here but the last thing I need for you to understand not only must you see him differently but the last thing the text says is that before you come into destiny there's gotta be yes Lord incorporated trouble tell your neighbor neighbor there's gotta be incorporated trouble in other words before you get into the promise you're gonna experience some trials and tribulation I heard the Bible say yeah and all those that live godly shall suffer persecution is there anybody in the room right now that know you shall have persecution tell your neighbor neighbor I'm mighty glad that I already know that I got trouble 
devil in the way. Job say, man that is born of a woman is up a few days and they are full of trouble. What you got to say about that, Pastor? Here's what I got to say. Because Joshua said, there's two sets of troubles that you got to deal with. Trouble number one is the enemies. And everybody in here got some enemies. Everybody in here got some haters. Slap your name with a high five and tell your name. I know I got some haters, but I think I ought to tell you, your haters ought to be your motivators. Thank God for your haters, because I discovered that if it wasn't for my haters, I wouldn't have some of the things that I have right now, because every time my haters are present, it makes God show out. I used to tell the Lord, Lord, I need you to do something about my haters. Lord, I need you to do something about my enemies. Jesus, I need you to get rid of all of those folk that's bothering me. And you know what the Lord told me? He said, Steve Hall, you don't want me to do that. I said, why, Lord? He said, you know that Psalms that you love so? I said, which one is that? He said, Psalms 23. I said, yes, Lord. He said, go rehearse it in your mind and you'll understand why you don't want me to get rid of your haters. And I got to rehearse it and I got to a certain verse and the light came on. That verse that says he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And I came in here to tell somebody no enemies, no table. So if I got to have some enemies to have a table, thank God for my enemies. Lean, 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 lean over. Shake somebody's hand. I learned how to trust in Jesus and I learned how to trust in God. I gotta leave y'all alone. But there's one more thing. He said, not only enemies, he said, but your environment. Because he says that there are seven enemies and he names them in verse number 10. But from verse number 13 on down to 17, he talks about the environment because in those seven verses he talk about John and John represents the environment you know what he said about the enemy he said the enemy won't be able to do you any harm because I've already taken care of your enemies but you want to know why he spends so much time talking about John because your environment can do more than your enemies because your environment fuels the greatest enemy and that is the enemy in a me that is your own your own self and I heard him say be careful when you go over Jordan because 
the sun yes love will take you under John will drown you and you know what John means it means the sender it means that there are times things will pop up out of nowhere I'm through and I tell you is there anybody in this room right now that's going through a storm in your life look like it just came out of nowhere anybody in this room going through trouble right now look like it came out of nowhere I'll tell you this we were supposed to be here earlier yesterday but this week was a week that it looked like all hell broke loose my my wife's mother was diagnosed with cancer just the other day and we were trying to deal with this because mother is a very vibrant woman never had sickness never had illness but all of a sudden thrown down on a bed of affliction and it threw us all for a loop but you know what the other day when they told mother that she had cancer I heard mother say something that helped me mother said I shall live and not die y'all ain't happy I shall live and not die to declare the glory of the Lord and I'm gonna close when I tell you some of you want to know why you're going through troubles why you're going through tribulation why you're going through heartaches because it's the order of God tell your neighbor it's the order of God and you gotta start looking at things like God look at them view them like God view them and I'll go to my seat with this you see trouble in the Bible is always equated to night time to evening and what you will discover is that the child of God has got to look at trouble from that perspective because when you see evening and equated to trouble it helps you understand why you got to go through trouble before you get to your destiny because when you look at evening there is a theological argument called the law of first mention and the law of first mention deals with the first time a thing is mentioned in the Bible when you use the law of first mention and equate it with evening here's what you understand that in Genesis chapter 1 verse number 5 here's what the Bible says and the evening and the morning was the first day I know that didn't hit you but I'm gonna try one more time the evening and the morning was the first day now the reason why that didn't hit you is because you've been Americanized too long but if you were a Jew you would understand that because the Jewish day starts at 6 in the evening because Jews view the day like God view the day and the day starts in the evening so therefore if you in the night time it only means that you in a new day because the evening and the morning was the first day you didn't get it that way let me try it one other way weeping me into a fun night but Shake off your troubles 
shake off your bed and I want somebody to know that if you can praise him in the middle of a storm that God does not show up for a pity party but he will show up for a praise party anybody in the room that's going through and you know that God's going to do it tell you what I want you to do get out of your seat I know it's a little crowd but find somebody on the other side of the road tell them here to tell you hold on your destiny is one step away tell them keep on walking because I I know that God's gonna do it anybody know that God's gonna do it say yeah And the devil don't understand sign language. He don't understand you thinking stuff. You got to open up your mouth because he knows what he's been doing in your life. He knows all of the havoc that he's been reaping in your life. And so he thinks you're going to quit. He thinks you're going to stop praising God. But I need somebody in the room that want to send the devil a message and tell the devil I got a yet praise I want you to open up your mouth and give God the loudest praise you got yeah 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 Bishop was still here on today. What a great message, Bishop. I want to thank all of you all again for tuning in to the Hall of Wisdom. Just as a reminder, you have until tomorrow night, midnight, to uh, send in those essays, okay? And that's for any college student. I want you to go ahead and send them in. Can't wait to see our new winners for 2021. God bless you. We will see you next month, first Saturday. God bless you.